thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Two presentations on urban agriculture is quite a luxury. And, and following Luke, it's very interesting. <coughs> Just um, in a previous life, in a previous life, when I visited any town, any city where I haven't been on any of these business trips like this one, I always like to go and to look at the old buildings, yeah, the cultural inheritance. Or I had my wife shopping last year and I did my duty. And so went from shop to shop. And then 20 years ago, I met Luc Mejot and <clears throat> he told me, you must look between the buildings. Yeah, there's also something interesting behind the buildings, yeah, urban agriculture. Yeah, and this brought me a bit off track. My wife still dislikes you, yeah, Luc. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So, um, this presentation is now not as beautiful as the other ones, please bear with me. Um, it's um, down to earth and it speaks, it has a lot of data and try to squeeze them all over in. And it's about what we know about urban agriculture and what we think we know but maybe we don't know. And in such a circumstances, I think books like this would come very handy, but these books are fake news. They don't exist. I'm very sorry for all of those who started Googling them. Um, and and that are not, this not the, next, the last time I will use this term fake news in this presentation. Um, <laughs> table of content. My table of content is tremendously short, which is unfortunately not representative for the number of slides I have. Um, so, again, apologies. Um, the first part is on the comparability of urban agricultural studies, and here I'm really speaking as a researcher who would like to compare, write refuse, etc. And the second part is about the urban agricultural benefits and risks, because there's a lot of talk about urban agriculture. So what of this is actually true? What do we know? And what are urban legends? And uh, for those of you who don't know what an urban legend is, um, I think the most famous one is the alligator in the New York sewer, a story which started in the 1920s, 30s, came again and again and again and again. There's sometimes some truths in, but mostly urban legends don't have real facts behind. And I think urban agriculture, urban legends, to some I thought, could be quite nice to continue this way. Part one, the comparability of urban agricultural studies. Um, huge challenge for us is the terminology. Um, especially when you want to go into anything quantitative. Qualitative studies, it might not matter too much, but as soon as we want to compare, for instance, the results from one city with the results from another city, and they're from different authors, it's a mess. And this challenge is actually known since 20 years, so it's a pity that I still have to speak about it. And, but quantitative data are very important, especially in such a domain like urban agriculture, where we would like to convince policymakers that there is maybe something of interest for them. It all starts with the definitions, and I don't take here any definitions from a student thesis. I take the definitions, the big ones, the big ones which are out from the big guys. And there are simple ones like that's farming in the city. Yeah, that was still a nice life when we said urban agriculture is farming in the city. But then came gurus like Luke Mojo and messed it all up. Um, oh, sorry, Luke. Uh, then there's another one. I, I go a bit down. That's actually from Wikipedia. So Wikipedia made it a bit more complex and said so that's a practice of cultivating, processing, distributing in and around town, city. So already. Imagine someone has a job to find out what, how many stakeholders are involved, and one follows the first definition and looks only in counting the farmers. The next one will count the whole post-harvest sector and everything. And I don't know who edited Wikipedia to put village there in. I think it must be someone from Sweden, maybe. I will come back to this to explain why I think so. Um, it could also be Norway or Denmark. And, and then there are these really, really big um, definitions, and this is only, look, I cut it by half because it was too long, I'm sorry. Um, so that it is an industry, and uh, there comes the whole circular economy context in, and that's the same actually what Luke had on one of his slides, and the food, and of course the non-food products, so it can be really complex, and that is probably the way we have to go. 
don't worry, I will not speak about this. I put it just in for the students because all these presentations will be later available. And there are huge differences between rural agriculture and urban agriculture. So when we want to approach this as a researcher, we have to use completely different methods. There's so much different, alone from the stakeholders involved. And I just want to look at the last two parts. Because when you work in rural agriculture, usually a lot of available data, statistics, there are whole ministries which deal with this. When you look at urban agriculture, at best a patchwork of data. So that's really which makes our life difficult. And then also that rural agriculture has a high research reputation. Yeah? Nobody's questioning this, that we work on rural agriculture. You come to urban agriculture, it's contested. And that's here. I just, from three papers, um, I took a summary statement which says much of the literature on urban agriculture has been driven by advocacy, benefits are exaggerated, and policy support should better turn to another direction. So that's, that's what we hear, yeah? So they say fake news, forget it. And, and these are serious papers who are then reviewing again a lot of literature. I wonder how they did this. But um, I come back to some of these, and that is the reality we are facing, and that's why it's very important that we really look how much can we quantify what we are speaking about. Is this really, is how big are the benefits, how big are the risks? Now, writing about urban agriculture makes a lot of headache. And it starts already in one paper, they speak about urban, and another they say it also includes peri-urban, some speak only about peri-urban. And of course, if you increase the scale, you get totally other systems, and many more stakeholders, many more farmers. It's, the numbers are no longer comparable. And then where does this peri-urban actually end and the rural start? Yeah, so some go out 10 kilometers, 20, 30, 40. Yeah, there are some methodologies for this I can share. Um, then how to capture these boundaries under urban growth? Yeah, this famous question, is urban agriculture only a fate, something which is temporarily there, and then it's again going out. So you try to observe the development of urban agriculture in a city over 10, 20 years. But where do you always put the boundary yeah, when it's, it's growing? And what's your benchmark? Or is it only about bench backyard gardening? Or is it the open space farming? Is it only about food or non-food? Is it the whole value chain along? And what actually is urban? Yeah, I, I bring it here, you will all know, but it's, it's always, again, for me, fascinating um, because there's no definition internationally for what is urban. So you compare, let's say, data from urban agriculture in Norway with urban agriculture in Japan, and as you will see on the next slide, that's a totally different world. There are fortunately at least 101 countries who use the population threshold to define what is urban and what is rural. There are others who define it by administrative criteria, infrastructure, population density, etc. And for instance, in Norway, something which has already 200 people. <sighs> it's a village, I would say. It comes when you come to the MDGs, they, they would say that's urban. So if you have in these 200 people have then 200 toilets, you have it achieved. And it's the same in Sweden. <laughs> So, um, it's the same in Denmark. Um, you go to Japan, you need at least 50,000 people in a settlement that they call it urban. So it's, it's very interesting. And then you must see this headache, what those people have who work on sustainable development goals and make a statistic for rural and urban. It's, it's all a mess, yeah? So, but okay, we don't want to speak about this. Um, so which urban boundaries do we use, for instance, when we want to see how urban agriculture develops over time? And I just have here the example, I would like to compare Hanoi with Accra. So Hanoi, when you look at the Hanoi metropolitan area, you will find 40 to 60 percent is agricultural land use. The world champions in urban agriculture, we could conclude. Yeah, in Accra, just 5 percent, nothing. Um, but then when we look at how they do it, the people in Hanoi are forward-looking. So when they defined the metropolitan area, they included a lot of hinterland. That's why actually the core of, Han of um, Hanoi is very small and there's not so much agriculture, but all this land around is counted. While Accra is totally, has a big problem. Since 20, 30 years, they don't expand the urban area. It's like it's totally outpaced by urban development because the surrounding districts don't want to become part of Accra. They want to be their own municipalities. It's a money question. So 
Um, administrative boundaries are really not helpful. That's the only message. That for forget it if you want to make comparisons. So what we normally do, we use remote sensing and um, try to find then out, is urban agriculture actually now declining in the city or is it increasing? And here just a few, a few, um, um, a bit of feedback on, on what we see, and this is based on, on the studies which I know. Uh, open space farming, so it's not about backyards. Backyards are always there somewhere, or it's mostly about these larger spaces, and we see very often that some of them can be over 50 years old, and they are there, and they stay there, but it's mostly then land which is somehow disadvantaged that you can't build there, or there are power lines above. And but with increasing inner city land shortage and with up land prices going up, many of these plots are then converted to other land use. And so we analyzed in Kumasi and Tamale and, and, and some of these in Accra, some of these cities, we analyzed that there's a decline of 50% in inside of the city of those plots that we measured some 10 years ago. So it looks as if urban agriculture is really only temporary and it's going down, but it's wrong. It's, it's just at the site it's going down, but the same farmers move to another site, and as the city is growing, then on the outer boundaries, you find them again. And so it's, it's, there's a compensation, and actually um, we, we say it's, it's something like shifting urban cultivation. So the urban agriculture might disappear on some sites, but the phenomenon within the city continues. And uh, coming back to these urban legends, um, one of the reasons why I think we, we are facing these and we are struggling is that urban agriculture as a discipline has so many stakeholders who are interested in the topic. You find papers from architecture, from public health, from urban planning from engineering, from all these kinds of disciplines, and they all work on it, plus the UN, as Luke just showed, and they use a variety of qualitative and quantitative methods, which are of very different scientific rigor, and then they are citing each other. So when the architects are citing something what the public health sector produced, they actually can't check if this was correct. So the number gets in the literature cited again and again and again, and I think this contributes to these urban legends. And I will just show three of them. Um, there's this famous number of the 800 million people from Jack Smith in the UNDP report, which every one of us who works on urban agriculture has cited at one or another point. And when Jack wrote this, he actually had such a disclaimer and said that's a rule of thumb. It's just something what he guesstimated. Um, but of course, nobody is citing the disclaimer, they're only citing this number, and so this number became on its own, and had its own life, and it's cited again and again and again and again, and then some of those who are criticizing urban agriculture said, actually, they found now out and discovered that the number has no real base. Oh my God, if you would have read the book, then, then you would know. Um, I personally struggled a lot with the second one, um, that urban agriculture produced 90% of all the vegetables in Accra. I don't know how they got this number, I don't know. Maybe there was a consultant for two days and he made some expert interviews. We had a big project over three years. We analyzed all the food flows, etc. And it's of course not all vegetables. A lot come from rural areas and whatever. And it's mostly smaller percentages. But whatever we published, this number was persistent because it's bigger. It's like in the yellow press. Uh, you, they always cite only the big numbers because they are very nice and that's the advocacy part. And um, we couldn't get rid of this number. So then we turned it around, we made our own urban legend. So one of my colleagues one time postulated that 20 million hectares of wastewater irrigation globally. Actually, it's not based on any real paper. It was just cited somewhere. And he made some calculations which I've never seen. And um, But this number was then used by the UN and everyone loved it. Yeah, so that's one of these urban legends. Sorry, but um, I'm correcting this. In the meantime, we corrected it. This year we corrected it. Um, coming to part two, the urban culture benefits and risks, there are many. I will not read this now. You know this, what all is, what people say, what is good, what are the advantages of urban agriculture. On the other hand, there are always those who say there are a lot of risk. And only those which are in bold, I will speak a little bit and, and bring some data to show 
um, how far these are legends or how far these are really um, facts. Um, so a bit on livelihoods, jobs and income, a bit on food supply, and on the other hand, a bit on the food safety risk there, especially on wastewater irrigation, which is mentioned very often because in and around the cities the water sources are polluted, a bit about the aquachemical pollution of the water bodies. Um, so the first one is, does urban agriculture play an important role in feeding the city? So that's one of these very common things. That's one what we discussed in our session. And I'm biased a bit to West Africa, but I first want to start with a statement which we had in our session, where one of our presenters said, the poorest, the most food insecure, are the least likely to engage in urban agriculture. Instead, it's a preserve of small agribusiness and a hobby of the rich. So those who have not been in our session might not think, which country does he come from? Now, there are some components in which look very southern, but then some components look a bit northern. And so that's a statement from South Africa. Yeah, and um, now I'm a bit more based, um, biased to, to West Africa, and, um, but did, of course, some, some literature search. So what do we know? We know when we look at the city level, not household level, but city level. City, the city, what the city gets as food, how much does the contribution of urban agriculture, um, because there's contributions which go beyond what the backyard is producing, which comes from these open spaces. And we know there can be contributions for up to 90% of very selected commodities. So we are never allowed to make any judgments that the city urban agriculture feeds the city. Very selective commodities, often those which are heat sensitive, very perishable, like leafy vegetables or milk. And there we have good data which can really substance, substance, or how to say this, substance, something like this, yeah. <laughs> so, this can be a very important contribution, especially where there's no alternative. Yeah, in other countries, you have already cool chains, you can fly things in, and you can transport it in. Um, but where there's no alternative, urban agriculture can have there for those commodities, like in Kumasi, 90% of the lettuce of the spring onions are really produced in the city of those which are consumed. So, but the majority of the food derives from much larger food sheds. I like this concept of food sheds, unless the rural urban linkages are cut. And we had such situations in the past, like in Freetown, Sierra Leone, there was civil war, there was no food anymore coming to the city, the city had to rely on itself, so there can be such situations, but in general, most of the food comes not from urban agriculture, but comes from outside. When we look at the household level now, backyards are usually small. Yeah, there are some which can also be larger, but from all the data which we looked at, it's usually less than 10% of the annual household food consumption which backyards can contribute. But they can be, again, for certain commodities, much higher shares. So if some have some poultry, they can eat the whole year their own eggs. But in general, from the whole household consumption, it's not so much. Coming to the nutritional value, because we often say that urban agriculture has this diversity of crops and in your backyard, and it helps you to be a much more healthier person. There are only very few studies which are based on really primary data. There's one from IFPRI, which is an excellent one. And otherwise, there, there was recently this FAO report, which says that in 10 or 15 countries across the global south, they really found evidence. But that was based on secondary data. It's based on living standard surveys. And actually, they asked in these surveys if the urban dwellers were engaged in farming, not if they were engaged in urban farming. And when we think on the first presentation we had, the first keynote uh, from Tom, he said that many of those who live in the city actually own, buy land outside. And many actually who live in the city also still have family land anyway in rural areas. So if we only look at those which are engaged in farming, they get, they get food from those areas. It's not, so it's a bit, it could be an urban legend what FAO tries to publish here. Um, just wanted to show this without going into any details. There are very interesting new studies coming out um, with the support of the Ruhr Foundation, with the support of FAO, 
project we are involved in is Urban Food Plus, which is looking at these food sheds and really tries, based on large number of data, to understand the food flows and the contributions of urban agriculture, peri-urban or rural agriculture. And they analyze all the flows and for a large number of commodities. It's really exciting research. Um, and there we could go steps further because mostly what these folks are doing, they measure the weight of these commodities, but the weight is often just the water content. Yeah, then wa the watermelons always win. Yeah, so it's uh, it would be much more interesting to translate this, for instance, into the vitamins or into the calories which come so that we can say what is really the contribution of urban agriculture. There's still a lot to do. Now, is urban agriculture an important livelihood strategy? So this is now not just about the food, it's about income. And I look first at backyard farming. Now, the data across West Africa shows that 20 to 50 percent of urban households have mostly tiny backyards. This might be often just a few plantains, might be a few chicken, as primarily for home consumption. But still, there are different numbers who are selling some of this. But what they are selling, this little surplus, is usually quite small. And so different studies from IFPRI, from, from FAO, and from us showed that usually the income range, this proportion of what comes from selling some of the urban agricultural produce from the household is very small, something like 2 to 18 percent. So it's not really a, a big factor. But interestingly, for the poorer households, it can be. And I think even if it's low, already 10 percent can be significant, especially when, for instance, there are women who have otherwise no income source, and this could be for them an income. So it might be quite good as a justification, for instance, for vertical farming, which can help on such even lowest and smallest spaces to make some money. And when we look at the open, open space, cash crop farming, uh, which we see now a lot in West Africa, um, just here the data from Accra, there are 1,000 hectare, 1,000 hectare Approximately 70% is under maize, 30% is under, under vegetables, wherever you find some water. And the vegetable part is involving some 900 farmers. And probably when I look at the post-harvest sector, there might be also, let's say, maximum 900 traders specialized in these vegetables. Um, for them, it's really a livelihood. For them, it's money. These farmers with year-round production make two to three times the money than what they would do if they would farm in rural areas. So this is money, and the profit margin is even higher for the traders, for the women. Um, so because there's a very strong gender differentiation, at least in Ghana, with the male farm and the females trading. So. It looks as if this is really a livelihood contribution, but now let's put it a bit in perspective. Are these jobs significant? Because we could also, of course, transform these thousand hectares into some kind of business park, and this could offer jobs on the same area for 50,000 or 70,000 people. So from a city perspective, the whole story is changing when we speak about is this a big um, livelihood provision from urban farming. Yeah, there is an alternative scenario possible. Um, the last part is on the risks for human and environmental health, and here a bit about wastewater. So what we do, do we know today about the global area under urban farming? Approximately 66 million hectare, with a rain-fed irrigation ratio of 2 to 1. And if we include also peri-urban, let's say a 20 kilometer artificial radius, we're getting approximately the size of the EU. That is globally what we have under urban and peri-urban agriculture. And of this, the irrigated share, approximately the size of Germany, that is what is affected with very poorly treated wastewater. So here we have a new number. It's actually not 30, it's something like 29.6. So, um, and I hope these 30 million hectares will replace our 2004 urban legend, and in this case I'm positive we will succeed because the number is bigger, yes? so they will go for the bigger number. Um, 
to illustrate this a bit, that was a slide from the Stockholm Water Week. Of these 30 million hectares which are there under wastewater irrigation, only 1 million hectares is using treated wastewater. The rest <laughs> is untreated wastewater, largely diluted. But just to show that the reality and problem now is again the terminology. When I look at papers which speak about wastewater reuse, nobody says if it is now indirect, diluted wastewater, is it a raw wastewater directly used. And the differences are, as you see on the photo, tremendous, not only in terms of yields, but also when you use raw wastewater, you have a much higher risk than when you use diluted wastewater. Um, coming back here to the risk assessment situation in Ghana, we did once an inventory. So how many wastewater treatment plants are there? Living in Ghana, I know how I would say, I would say now, Ghana's blessed with wastewater treatment plants. There's so many, 70, decentralized mostly. We looked how many of them work, bang. Yeah. Uh, so that's why there's no treated wastewater for Ghana's vegetable farmers. They all have to face it. And then what is the risk from this? At risk are every day approximately 2,500 to 3,000 farmers and traders, approximately 20,000 in the post-harvest sector, those who are then in the street food restaurants and are using these raw salads and preparing them because that's a very famous side dish only in the street food sector, not at home in Anglophone Africa. And every day, from 600 to 800,000 people in the urban streets from the five largest cities are eating these vegetables. Um, it's quite interesting with Francophone West Africa because the f cuisine Francaise introduced raw salads also in the home. So they're also at home, not only in the street you eat raw salads. And so you think, okay, the risk must multiply. No, the risk actually goes down because they also introduced how to wash vegetables. And they use eau de javel. Eau de javel sounds very beautiful, very French, yeah, um, Luke. Um, eau de javel is nothing else than, I keep to the two. Eau de javel is nothing else than bleach. Yeah, but if you use it at the right concentration and the people are trained, you kill all the pathogens. Um, and those who speak Dali language, disability adjusted life years, we analyzed this all would come down to approximately 12,000 Dalis lost. That is how the health sector is expressing diseases across different burdens. That's 10% of the wash related diseases in urban Ghana. Or when you do a comparative risk analysis, and that's always important, you cannot just say there is a risk. Yeah, okay, there's a risk, but what does the risk mean for a policymaker if he has to invest some money, which risk to tackle first? It's actually the second largest risk next to children exposed to drainage water in, in the street drain. And actually the risk with the wastewater we can control. So there are many very easy ways how you can reduce this pathogenic risk, and this is a very cost-effective way. While if you would close all these gutters, you would have to pay $500 per DALI, um, reducing here the risk from the food with the pathogen is $90 per DALI. So just to give there a bit, this is the last slide. Um, and the environmental risk, just another nice way of framing it from the data we have. The volume of wastewater in Accra, which is supplied by urban farmers, is twice as large as the water which actually goes to the treatment plants. So the, the wastewater applied on Accra's urban farms, which we could consider some kind of land treatment, is twice as large as what goes to the wastewater treatment plants, which anyway don't work, as we just saw on the previous slide. So actually, Urban agriculture has some kind of treatment benefit which it offers the city, which certainly is much, much larger than any runoff which could come from the small area of 5% of the city and might enter some surface water compared to the streams which you see here in the background, which are loaded with household liquid and solid waste from 95% of the area. So here I would, I would really say urban agriculture is having more benefits than since it is really contributing something bad. So my conclusions are 
comparable data on urban agriculture are still an exception. A lot of claims on how important or unimportant urban agriculture is, but the amount of published quantitative work on the advantages or risk is very limited. The available studies suffer usually from unclear system boundaries. Is it urban or also peri-urban? And many results depend really on the local context, like what our colleague from South Africa reported, and the stakeholder perspective. So, of course, the farmer, and you count the farmers, they will say, yes, it's our livelihood, but maybe you could do something from a planning perspective differently with the same area. I think it's time to move urban agriculture beyond this being a phenomenon and beyond this existing patchwork of data, using more rigorous science to avoid creating further urban legends and to send the <laughs> crop back onto the sewer and then it will never <laughs> more come up. Thank you very much.